Quran, it is clear that the Quran is a revelation from the Almighty God. As six, the Quran describes things around us, not to teach us science, but to call our attention to the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the majesty of his creation. Uh, in, in describing the things, however, the Quran uses language which modern scientists uh, are now seeing uh, show uh, that the author of the Quran, whoever was using this language and stating things in this way, uh, uh, well, could not have been a human being from that time because people just simply did not know this sort of thing that we now take for granted as uh, modern scientific knowledge and that shows that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quick example of this, the Quran speaks about the expansion of the universe. In Surah Al-Dhariyat, Surah 51 verse 47, as for the heavens, we have created it with power and we are expanding it. This is a modern concept. Actually, uh, two scientists, uh, Penzias and Wilson, won the Nobel Prize in 1964 for finally proving, after much uh, re resistance and hesitation among scientists, for finally proving that uh, the universe uh, is expanding and that uh, by implication means that it began a final, finite time ago. The idea that the universe is expanding, uh, now finally proven and, and, and an accepted uh, uh, theory of modern science uh, has already been stated in the Quran some 1400 years ago. So that's my sixth point. And seven, uh, we can uh, mention very quickly again that the, the Quran is arranged in such a way that when people study it nowadays, they see a construction in the Quran that is not due to any human thinking. It's now our human discovery, but no human being thought about how to put it in this way. Anyone who's familiar with the way in which the Quran came to be written and collected as a writing will know that uh, when you read these, uh, uh, the history of the collection, you just hope that everyone has got it right because the Quran was written in a variety of materials. They were eventually collected within the two years after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. They were eventually copied in the Caliphate of uh, Uthman, Yalahuan, sent to various provinces and so on. Uh, in, initially, they did not uh, have all of the markings, all of the dottings and the vowels and so on put in. The verse numbers were not put in. Eventually, people will think about where the Qari stop and start numbering the verses in a delib deliberate way. At first, every 10 verses and then every 5 verses until eventually now we have every verse numbered so we can locate the verse very easily. So if I say Surah Al-Dhariyat, Surah 51, verse 47, you know precisely where to go and find it quickly. So that becomes now a reader-friendly text. It's uh, made uh, easy for, for the, the reader to make full use of it. So when you read that history, you see that no human being deliberately thought, okay, I want to change this around, I want to put that this way, and I want to make this fit like that. But now, when we step back from the Quran and we ask certain questions, we see that things turn out in the Quran as though there was a plan. And though the, since this was not a human plan, obviously it is the divine plan. For example, what do you make of the fact that the Quran mentions the word day Yom in Arabic, in the singular, exactly 365 times. Now think about having to write an essay, and your professor says, write me an essay uh, between 3,000 and 4,000 words of length. And you have difficulty getting your ideas across and fitting it within that, uh, that, that frame of reference, between 3,000 and 4,000. Sometimes you go over, you chop it down a little bit, you go on under. It's almost like cutting your hair. So you cut one side, it's a bit too short. You cut the other side to make it even, that's gone too short. And then you cut the other side again. So we know our human failings and how difficult it is to get things like this right. Uh, how did it come about that the Quran has it like this? And that's just one example. We can look at a number of examples and very quickly, uh, the word for man in the Quran uh, occurs 24 times and the word for woman, imra'ah, occurs also 24 times. The word for Adam occurs 25 times and the word for the name Isa occurs also 25 times. Now, when you realize that seldom do they occur together, in fact, only in one verse does the name Adam and Isa occur together. That's in Surah 3, verse 59. Elsewhere, they're scattered throughout. So you have to ask yourself, if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wanted these names to come out exactly the same number of times in his entire book, how does he keep that all in his mind? The word for dunya it, it occurs in the Quran 115 times. The word for akhirah also 115 times. The word for shaitan 
occurs in the Quran 68 times. And for angels, malaika, also 68 times. So how does that come about by sheer coincidence? Do we not have here a plan? Obviously we do. But this, as we have seen, is not the plan of any human being. The human beings just try to collect and to copy and proliferate the Quran the way they learned it. And we are now realizing that the Quran is actually structured in such a way that there is a mind behind it. And since that is not any human mind, if you think of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, keeping all of these numbers in his mind, he would really be insane. You know, you think about what he would have to do to, to make this work. His mind would have to be a computer mind. He would have to open up his mind into something like a Microsoft uh, Excel a worksheet program or any worksheet program. You have a number of rows and a number of columns. Uh, one row for each verse of the Quran and one column for each one of these words he wants to come out matching. One for man, one for woman, one for Adam, one for uh, Jesus, uh, one for dunya, one for akhirah, one for shaitan, one for malaika. Every time he recites a verse, if it mentions man, he has to click one in the man column. If it mentions woman, he has to click one in the woman column. If it mentions dunya, he has to click one over there. And he has to keep his mind on the bottom to make sure the number are still matching. That would be too much, really, for a human being. In fact, it is rather insane or, or absurd to suggest that this is what he has done. And if he has done that, why didn't he tell anybody? Look at my great work. How did he know that in the modern computer age, we will actually be able to feed the computer data into a modern computer, and we will generate all of these results and see how well they match and, and, and how much these counts uh, turn out to be? It turns out then that finally, the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's only my seventh uh, point so far. So very quickly to complete, I can say that eighth, we can look at the fact that the Quran challenges people to find errors in the book. And nobody has been able to come up with anything uh, that is an example of a genuine error in the Quran. Though they have shown us many examples of their own misunderstanding of the text. And the Quran said this in advance. They will object to that which they do not understand. And uh, nine, uh, we can look at the fact that the Quran uh, challenges people to produce a book like like this. And though many people have wasted their lives trying to, to defeat the Quran and to, to uh, expel Muslims from their homes and from their lands and to defeat and decimate the Muslim populations to make sure that the message would not be heard, nevertheless, nobody has come up with a book that is similar to the Quran to disprove the Quranic challenge that another one cannot be produced like this one. And finally, we can say, read the Quran for yourself and see if this really is not the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will find that the Quran is a reasonable book. Its doctrines and teachings are quite reasonable and intellectually satisfying. Its, its, its practices are actually very practical. When you think of the, of the details of the practices, sometimes on the surface you might think like prayer and salat and so on, these seem to be hard. But when you think about the details of the practicality that's involved in all of these, ask uh, uh, our Qari, uh, Abdul Rashid Brown, he'll tell you about how practical these uh, various practices of Islam are, when you look at them and you look at all of the, uh, the, the ways in which the fiqh has catered uh, for the practical needs of individuals, when you think about the purposes behind all of these things. Let me give you a quick example. You might think of salat, and somebody may say, salat, look, that, 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 that's too hard, man. I can't pray all of this. But, uh, you know, if people don't pray, they become couch potatoes. Then they say they have to go to the gym to work out. By your prayer, you have a spiritual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, you get some physical exercise. Some people uh, say, okay, they're losing all the spiritual connection, and uh, Brother Yusuf was talking about people turning to yoga and transcendental meditation and so on. In the Salah, you combine both. You've gone to the gym and you've done your, your transcendental meditation all in one in a simple process, and you're not a couch potato. I travel by air a lot, and I see sometimes they show you videos on how to exercise yourself while you're sitting there in your seat. And sometimes they tell you what to do, you know, raise your hand, uh, turn your neck like that, and so on. So I do that too. Allahu Akbar. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. So, uh, but, <laughs> So, in short, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this book has given us a, a reasonable system of belief and practice, and in the end, that is proof enough for us. Uh, finally, uh, we have here several good arguments for thinking that the, that, uh, the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have looked at, uh, I believe, ten arguments there. Let's call that our top ten reasons for thinking that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then to wrap up this speech then, how many reasons have we given to show that uh, really God exists? Uh, the, the first, we have said we don't really need a reason uh, because we know that God exists. We don't have to prove it to somebody else. We just know.
know it for ourselves. Somebody who thinks that God does not exist should have the burden of proof. He should prove to us that God does not exist because I know my friend. Why should I stop believing that my friend exists just because somebody says he doesn't? And, and I ask him, what is his reason? He has no reason. Why should I give up knowing my friend uh, for no reason at all? On the other hand, I've seen that there are four good reasons now for thinking that God exists. First, the cosmological argument. The universe exists. It must have a cause, and the cause of that is God. Second, the universe has every feature of being designed. That calls for a designer, and obviously the designer is the God that we're speaking of. Third, we have a moral sense, which has to be grounded in something real. It's not something that we invented, but it's something beyond us. And because even atheists seem to have this moral sense, obviously atheists are not working on the presumption of atheism when they try to prove that they can be good people as well. They are pre working on the presumption of theism that there is a real good and a real bad. Not, a, not, not good and bad by definition or by convention, but good or bad in the real moral sense of the, of the term. And therefore they're working themselves on the presumption that God exists, who is the source and the grounding of our moral sense. And fourth, we have seen that the Quran, with all of the detailed arguments I've given, really is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that proves to us, not only that God exists, but that he has a detailed plan for us, a reason for creating us. And he has given us a guidance on how to live in, on, this world, on this earth in such a way as to fulfill the purpose for which we have been created. So finally, the atheist saying, okay, well, we can't believe in God because there's so much evil and suffering in the world. Well, that doesn't really hold, my brother, because the fact that there is evil and suffering in the world does not prove that God exists. It only proves now that God may have some good reasons for allowing evil and suffering in the world. For example, God may be testing individuals. God may be punishing some individuals to bring them back to the right path. If they might uh, perhaps not respond in ease, God might cause them to respond in difficulty. And uh, third, we have seen that God has given free will to human beings and to some of his creatures in general, which would imply and entail that some of these creatures will misuse their freedom and do evil things. So there will be some bad uh, things in the world, not because God is unable and not because he doesn't know uh, and, and not because he's not loving or kind. He is all of those things. He is loving and kind. He, not, he does know. Uh, he, he does have the power to remove all of these things, but... He has a greater plan, and in that greater plan, he allows for some evil and suffering because they themselves lead to some greater good. For example, when the believers suffer a little bit in this world and he remains patient, he gets a larger reward in the life hereafter. So somebody may be zooming in and looking at the little red spot there. Actually, there is a spot right now. <laughs> but uh, if you step back and look at the large picture, you don't see that anymore. So from our point of view, we see the dunya, it's close, and we see that there is some problem here. But from Allah's perspective, he sees the vast spectrum, not only this life, but the entire eternity. And on that large canvas, the difficulties that we face in this life is only minuscule. And in fact, when the believer leaves this world and goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will see also that larger canvas. And when he sees that, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the person who was disobeying him, but he was in all of the luxuries in this life, what did you enjoy in the life? He said, I had no enjoyment. Because now he sees the reality of the punishment that awaits him. And when the believer comes before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him, what did you suffer in the world? He said, I never suffered anything in the world. Because now he sees the vast reality of the life eternal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of him. All of the suffering that he's had in this world pales by comparison. It is forgotten. It is nothing by comparison. So ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan for us. And he's revealed for us that plan in the Quran. That, ikhwan. And brothers and sisters is what we have to follow and that is what we have to share with the world so finally ask ourselves what are we doing here are the atheists publishing books they're giving talks they're appearing on television and all of that and they're promoting atheism what are we doing shaitan has to always do his work we don't understand that sometimes you just uh, you know we rave you become excited oh why is he how does he dare so, uh, shaitan is going to do his work, brothers and sisters. But why aren't we doing ours? Let the truth be proclaimed. And when the truth comes, Zahak al-Batil. قُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ The truth has come, and the false falsehood, 
disappears. The bottle is always going to be receding into the cracks from which it has come in the first place. But the truth has to be proclaimed. If you want to get rid of the darkness, turn on the light. Where is the light from the believers? Why aren't the believers engaged in da'wah and presenting the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I spoke about the top 10 reasons of, for believing the Quran to be the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I didn't have to go into details because you know these details. I saw your eyes lighting up, your faces smiling as you heard this because you recognize this to be so true. But it's not for you to recognize, it's for the others who don't know it yet to hear it from you. So how are they going to hear it if we do not do anything? So I'd like to plead with you, brothers and sisters, get involved in da'wah. On the personal level, in your own way. If you don't know what precisely to say, get a piece of uh, written material, an audio uh, visual material or anything. Give them something, introduce them uh, to, to Islam. Help and support the da'wah organizations, such as IPCI. Who, you know, Sheikh Ahmad Didat, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him, has introduced us to the idea that we can actually present Islam in these kinds of public uh, manner to the non-Muslims. Let us continue in that legacy and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept his work and ours and let us support the organization that he has left behind and the people who are working so hard like Brother Yusuf Ismail and others. Uh, let, let us help them to continue the work in, in that uh, public way in which they are doing because after all there's only so much we can do as individuals, but we also have to do it as a team. In Surah Al Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Well minkum ummah, let there be among you a group, Yaduna ilal khair, who will do the da'wah towards the good. And these are the people who are going to be successful. So let us be part of that group, that successful group with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa akhir da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, thank you brother Shabir for that inspiring and certainly delightful lecture. It's not something we hear too often in South Africa and certainly not in our masajid. So I won't even attempt to summarize it with the exception that speaking on atheism in a report in Megatrends 2000, 10 new directions for the 1990s, there's been despite atheism, despite the, the popular culture that's been drummed into us, there's been an increase in re religious re revival in terms of belief. Close to 300 million individuals have turned to religion in the last decade. If there's anyone out here that wishes to ask a question to Brother Shabir, um, you can do so now. Uh, we've got a question sent down to the table here uh, to Brother Shabir. What does the Bible say about the Christian concept of the Trinity? The word Trinity does not exist in the Bible anywhere. The word Trinity itself was coined after the Bible, long after the Bible was written uh, to express a developing concept. That is the concept that there are three persons who are each by himself God and yet together the three persons are just one God. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Ghost is God, but there, there is really only one God. Uh, the, the idea that there is only one God is well rooted in the Bible. Uh, several passages in the Bible, both in the Old and in the New Testament, from the lips of Moses and on the lips of Jesus, uh, all of these passages continue to insist that there is only one God. But over time, it seems that after the Bible was written, there was a development uh, in, in that people began to, uh, to say that Jesus is, is God in a way. And uh, that led eventually to the full proclamation that he is really God. And now you have to deal with the fact that you should only have one God, but you're calling the Father God, and now you're calling Jesus the Son of God, and thinking that he's really God, so you have to make them one. And then you have to say something about the Holy Spirit. So uh, councils were held uh, in early Christianity to decide these issues. First was the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, in which it was decided that Jesus is very God of very God. And then in, the, in a subsequent council in the year 381, Council of Constantinople, that is when they made a proclamation about the Holy Spirit so that we can eventually get the full doctrine of the 
Holy Trinity. But the Bible itself continues to insist that there is only one God. There are some passages of the Bible which some Christians would interpret as being in some way supportive of their belief in the Trinity, but these passages do not explicitly state the Trinity doctrine, and in fact they're far removed from saying anything like the Trinity doctrine. There was one verse of the Bible which would have been very close, not quite, but very close to saying that God is a Trinity. That is uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 in the King James Version of the Bible. It says that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. But that verse has been found to be a later insertion into the Bible. And for this reason, the verse has now been removed from many modern translations. So if you look at the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the uh, New American Bible, uh, the New Jerusalem Bible, New International Version of the Bible, you will find that in all of these versions, this passage, the First John chapter 5, verse 7, has been removed. Uh, in some Bibles, they have kept the number seven, but they have split a verse, another verse to fill up that space. Otherwise, you'd have an empty space there. One would look and see that number seven, oh, there's nothing in that space. So now uh, another verse has been split to fill up the space, but the words, which used to be in First John chapter 5, verse 7, the words that say that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, those words have been removed from the modern translations. There's another question. You said in your lecture the word yom, which means day, is mentioned 365 times. What about the leap year? Technically, it's 364 and a quarter days. Actually, it's 365 and a quarter, but uh, your point is still um, valid in that um, the, the Quran uh, sh uh, could have stated that uh, the, uh, a, the year is usually 365 days and uh, in a leap year it is 366. Uh, but, but that's not the point. It's not the point that the Quran stated that there are 365 days in the year. Uh, the fact is that when we now, as a matter of curiosity, comb the Quran and ask how many times does the Quran mention the word day? It, and we come up with the, word, with the number 365. We see that the Quran uses the word day 365 times. Now that immediately strikes us as a meaningful number. So we should ask then, did the writer of the Quran know that he was doing this? And did he intend to do it this way? Or did this just happen by coincidence? Three, 365, everyone will, will take as usually the number of days in a year. 365 days in a, in a year, except for a leap year in which there are 366 days. So the leap year is the exception. The normal thing is that there are 365 days. This is the, this is the known item. Now anyone can write, a child can write, there are 365 days in a year. So if the Quran said there are 365 days in a year, that's not anything special yet. But the point is, if we pick up a book, any book, let's say this book for example, what are the chances that this book mentions the word day exactly 365 times? It is so remote, isn't it? So if you do find that it mentions the word day 365 times precisely, now you, you have a sense that perhaps this was done deliberately. And if that was the only thing, you can say, okay, maybe it wasn't deliberate, that's just a one-off chance that something just turned out to be meaningful like that. But when you see that there are so many things that line up, like the fact that uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Adam and Isa are alive for the heavens, we have created it with power, and we are expanding it. This is a modern concept. Actually, uh, two scientists, uh, Penzias and Wilson, won the Nobel Prize in 1964 for finally proving, after much uh, resistance and hesitation among scientists, for finally proving that uh, the universe uh, is expanding, and that uh, by implication means that it began a finite, finite time ago. The idea that the universe is expanding, uh, now finally proven, and, and, and an accepted uh, uh, theory of modern science uh, has already been stated in the Quran some 1400 years ago. 
So that's my sixth point. And seven, uh, we can uh, mention very quickly again that the, the Quran is arranged in such a way that when people study it nowadays, they see a construction in the Quran that is not due to any human thinking. It's now our wrong. It is clear that the Quran is a revelation from the Almighty God. A six. The Quran describes things around us, not to teach us science, but to call our attention to the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the majesty of his creation. Uh, in, in describing the things, however, the Quran uses language which modern scientists uh, are now seeing uh, show uh, that the author of the Quran, whoever was using this language and stating things in this way, uh, uh, well, could not have been a human being from that time because people just simply did not know this sort of thing that we now take for granted as uh, modern scientific knowledge and that shows that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quick example of this, the Quran speaks about the expansion of the universe. In Surah al dhariyat Surah 51 verse 47, as it becomes now a reader friendly text, it's uh, made uh, easy for, for the, the reader to make full use of it. So when you read that history, you see that no human being deliberately thought, okay, I want to change this around, I want to put that this way, and I want to make this fit like that. But now, when we step back from the Quran and we ask certain questions, we see that things turn out in the Quran as though there was a plan. And though the, since this was not a human plan, obviously it is the divine plan. For example, what do you make of the fact that the Quran mentions the word day, yawm, in Arabic, in the singular, exactly 365 times? Now think about having to write an essay. And your professor says, write me an essay uh, between 3,000 and 4,000 words of length. And you have difficulty getting your ideas across and fitting it within that human discovery, but no human being thought about how to put it in this way. Anyone who's familiar with the way in which the Quran came to be written and collected as a writing will know that uh, when you read these, uh, uh, the history of the collection, you just hope that everyone has got it right because the Quran was written in a variety of materials. They were eventually collected within the two years after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. They were eventually copied in the Caliphate of Uthman, sent to various provinces and so on. Uh, in, initially, they did not uh, have all of the markings, all of the dottings and the vowels and so on put in. The verse numbers were not put in. Eventually, people will think about where the Qari stop and start numbering the verses in a delib deliberate way. At first, every ten verses and then every five verses until eventually now we have every verse numbered so we can locate the verse very easily. So if I say Surah Al-Dhariyat, Surah 51, verse 47, you know precisely where to go and find it quickly. So that... Uh, that, that frame of reference between 3,000 and 4,000. Sometimes you go over, you chop it down a little bit, you go on under. It's almost like cutting your hair. So you cut one side, it's a bit too short. You cut the other side to make it even, that's gone too short. And then you cut the other side again. So we know our human failings and how difficult it is to get things like this right. Uh, how did it come about that the Quran has it like this? And that's just one example. We can look at a number of examples, and very quickly, uh, the word for man in the Quran uh, occurs 24 times, and the word for woman, imra'ah, occurs also 24 times. The word for Adam occurs 25 times, and the word for the name Isa occurs also 25 times. Now, when you realize that seldom do they occur together, in fact, only in one verse does the name Adam and Isa occur together. That's in Surah 3, verse 59. Elsewhere, they are scattered throughout. So you have to ask yourself, if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wanted these names,